welcome to this first panel of our anniversary event. Uh, my name is Helen Young, and I am one of the co-editors of the Disasters Journal. Having joined the editorial team, I realize now 20 years ago, which came a bit of a shock when I did the maths. Um, anyway, we have a very great opportunity this morning, um, rare and unique, in considering how decades of disaster studies have evolved globally. And I'm delighted to be joined on the panel by four highly regarded scholars and academics from all corners of the globe, including um, the South, Southeast Asia and the Pacific, Latin America, China, and the Horn of Africa. Now, before I introduce them, I want to share with you just a few personal reflections. Um, I actually went back to some of the early editions of Disasters in preparation, and what I noticed was the explicit reference in those early editions encouraging field workers, as well as researchers, to publish new findings, reports from the field, and disaster technology, including innovations and techniques specific to disaster operations. So it struck me that right from the very start, the Disasters Journal was aiming to provide a unique forum for both academics and practitioners to exchange insights and learning. And I think this has been one of its unique contributions, bridging the divide between research, practice, and policy. Now, in recent years, we know that um, this has become increasingly important, and there's been a significant shift towards what we call evidence-based practice. And increasingly, I think there is support for research as part of emergency programs, and so as you know, to promote further learning and inf influence policy and practice. Um, and I don't think there's any doubt that this research has generated significant advances, especially technological ones. And in my field, that would cover the treatment of severe malnutrition and saving lives in acute crises. But I'm struck, um, looking back, that overall, the field of emergency response has changed relatively little. In nutrition, for example, the package of emergency programs has essentially remained the same for the past 30 years. If anything, it's narrowed. And at the same time, we see international agencies implementing the same interventions year in, year out, in the same locations. Sometimes this goes on for decades in protracted crises or recurring emergencies. And many of these contexts share in common what we call, in my field, persistent GAM. In other words, levels of acute malnutrition that exceed the emergency threshold continually, year in, year out, for decades. This is not only happening in places like Somalia and South Sudan, but in many countries across the Sahel, in Asia, and in many refugee contexts. And yet there is little published on this. Consequently, however, there are efforts to deepen the analysis expand the toolbox as the recent focus on building resilience, integrated multi-sectoral programming, and these other phrases um, are, are, are testament to. But to my knowledge, the, to my knowledge, the cha many challenges remain, and there's yet to emerge a body of learning and practice that can address this particular issue in both long-term protracted and recurring crises. So with such challenges ahead, I think there will continue to be a vital role for disaster studies for the foreseeable future, especially if it can continue to bridge that research, policy, practice divide. Anyway, enough of my reflections. Let me move on and introduce our expert panel. And just before I do so, let me remind you uh, to tweet about this morning's debate uh, with the Twitter handles that you can see on the screen. So this morning, I am joined by uh, Professor J.C. Gaya from the University of Auckland and previously with the University of Philippines. His work, as many of you will know, focuses on developing participatory tools for engaging minority groups in disaster risk reduction with an emphasis on ethnic and gender minorities, children, children prisoners, and homeless people. On my right, we're very honored to have Professor Lan Shui, who is the Chung, Chung Kong Chair, Professor, and Dean of the School of Public Policy and Management at Tsinghua University. His teaching and research interests include STI policy, 
crisis management and global governance. He also serves as an adjunct professor at the Carnegie Mellon University and is a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. He's a member of the National Committee for Strategic Consultation and Comprehensive Review and co-chair of the Leadership Council of the UN Sustainable Development Solution Network. We are also joined from Latin America by Professor Irasema Alcantara from the Institute of Geography at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. Her, her research is focused on mass movement processes, disaster risk reduction, and integrated research on disaster risk. She is the ex-president of the Mexican Society of Geomorphology and past vice president of the International Geographical uh, Union. And finally, I'm delighted to say that we are joined by Professor Luca Biongdeng via our connection with Washington. Uh, Luca is a professor of practice at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies at the US National Defense University. He's also a global fellow at the Peace Research Institute in Oslo. He was a resident senior fellow at Harvard Kennedy School and also served as the director of the Center for Peace and Development Studies at the University of Juba, South Sudan. And he has been a minister in the office of the president of Southern Sudan and a minister of cabinet affairs of Sudan. He also worked as a senior economist for the World Bank. And we are very grateful that, um, for Luca joining us from Washington, which has meant a very, very early start. Now, I'm going to begin the session by asking each of the panelists an opening question um, before engaging our speakers in a debate that will hopefully allow plenty of time for questions from you, the audience. And I really want to stress that we want to hear from as many people as possible, um, which means that when we come to the questions, I'd be grateful if we can keep them short. OK, so first of all, um, JC. In your part of the world, how has the study of disasters evolved in Southeast Asia and the Pacific? When we think of countries in that region, for example, the Philippines, um, it's among one of the world's most disaster-prone countries. Have, have we seen a shift in the way we think about disasters there? Thanks, Ellen. And uh, thanks, Sarah, and everyone here at ODI for organizing the, this event. I mean, I'm very honored to be here. I remember the first time I handled the printed copy of the journal. It was exactly 20 years ago in the Philippines. And I was starting my PhD. It was like the Bible back then. So 20 years on, I wasn't expecting to be here now. Um, so yeah, Southeast Asia and the Pacific. I think the, um, uh, the most important thing is that the region has been somehow a playground for uh, foreign researchers. And one of the favorite playgrounds for especially Western researchers. Um, and I'm including here as well uh, New Zealand. Just look at what happened after the 2010-2011 Canterbury earthquakes. We had a uh, um, massive influx of researchers coming from the UK and, and elsewhere. And that, I mean, um, I think um, raised a major query or question we don't often ask to ourselves, I think, and I'm very much part of this somehow because I did my research in the Philippines is who does research where uh, based on whose priorities and at the benefit of whom. I mean, there are underpinning power relations between researchers and research institutions and underpinning these kind of uh, unequal power relations. And I haven't done the math for disasters, but I'm pretty sure that over the past 40 years, most of the papers published on the region have been by foreign researchers. Um, and I think we need to ask these questions. I mean, we did in a paper with a colleague of mine a few years ago. It was very, very controversial. Um, but I think it's important. Who does the research where based on whose priorities are the benefit of whom? Um, and there are many reasons for that. And I don't think we can go through all the reasons now. Uh, there are international issues around, I mean, how the research uh, funding mechanisms and, and uh, priorities are defined by international organizations, by international data agencies. Uh, they are post-colonial heritages in terms of relationships between um, European countries and their former colonies and who does research where. Um, and obviously what we talked about earlier in terms of citations 
and the pressure for researchers in Western institutions to publish on large-scale events because these will probably steer more attention and ultimately get more citations, meaning more uh, opportunity for tenure uh, at the university. So there, there are questions behind that. But there are local factors as well uh, in the region, and the region is so diverse that, um, I mean, those factors depend on, on who you are and where you are. Um, I mean, it could, be, it could be the size of the, of the countries. I mean, we've got all the countries in the Pacific being small, and probably many of them don't have the, the capacity to actually conduct research. Uh, as we would think we could do uh, in the West, I'm thinking of, of uh, Vanuatu after Cyclone Pam or Kiribati uh, in the face of, of uh, climate change. Fiji is a special case because you can't tell Fijian that they don't have the capacity at the scale of the Pacific. They are a big player. And they have some strong universities there. Um, but you have as well, I mean, the, the, the existing expertise and strengths of research. I mean, New Zealand has traditionally been uh, very strong for earth sciences and environmental sciences. And it explains why we have so many uh, hazard-driven researchers there more than social science research, and it very much reflects the, the, the country and its uh, research environment. Um, there's the ability to communicate in English, which is again a big deal in terms of publication and how you communicate the outcomes of your research, uh, especially I'm thinking of Indonesia here. Uh, it's been a big, big issue for Indonesians to actually publish in English, and they're still, I mean, they're, they are getting there at the moment. And there are political issues as well, political context. And the Philippines, I think, is, a, is an interesting case here. Uh, because we had pioneer papers published in disasters uh, by Filipino, including my mentor Zen Delica back in the, in the early 1990s. Uh, but these papers were mostly published by practitioners, interestingly, and not really by academics. Uh, and this is because disasters were in the Philippines, first and foremost, back then a political object and not a scientific object. It was an opportunity to actually emphasize skewed development and how, uh, I mean, an opportunity for challenging uh, the government in a post-dictature area, post marcos area. And if you look at how disaster risk reduction and all the NGO, very vibrant network emerged in the Philippines, mostly uh, from the anti-Marcos struggle back in the 1970s and 80s. So it, disasters were kind of a political object to be used to actually challenge uh, the government and the norms. And these journals were somehow um, an opportunity to broadcast those issues outside of the Philippines. There's a very specific context to the Philippines. Uh, so we have all these issues, but the picture is changing at the moment. The game is changing quickly. Um, it's changing <coughs> largely because of the occurrence of large events. Uh, look at what happened in the Philippines uh, in 2009 after Cyclone or Typhoon Ondoy and Peping in September and October, which was a big deal because it struck Manila. And many of the university students were affected or responded to the events and then started to get interested in the issue and develop their own research. And Yolanda was just, just a catalyst afterward. The big deal was Ondoy in 2009. Uh, and now we have a flurry of um, fantastic Filipino researchers doing Philippine, I mean, Philippine-based research on disasters um, um, in many, many different uh, topics. Uh, we had the tsunami in Indonesia, of course, 2004, that triggered uh, uh, an oomph somehow of research in Indonesia on, on disasters. Uh, even in New Zealand, I mean, the Canterbury earthquakes uh, were a big deal to actually stimulate social science research. Although it's still very hazardy, uh, in the sense that most of those who are doing social science research in New Zealand have a physical science or engineering background, which is very interesting. I think we are the most social, or the most radical kind of group in New Zealand at the moment, and it's kind of sometimes uncomfortable position. Um, and the Pacific is very climate changey somehow, and uh, there are many reasons we won't. You don't want me to rant about this, and Elon Knight as well. Um, anyway, uh, so this la landscape is changing. Uh, I haven't spoken a lot about the Western island of New Zealand, also known as Australia. Uh, teasing the Aussies, if there are Aussies in the room. Um, I mean, I think it's, it's a bit 
different in Australia. I mean, they've got their own world. Uh, their research is, is very diverse at the moment. Um, and they've been less affected, I think, by the, by the overseas kind of influence of foreign researchers coming, coming in Australia. Um, and I think that my, my final point would be another big question is uh, where is this current research going and reflecting upon what uh, Jan said this morning and I think Ilan as well, uh, is do we, do we actually really need this more research in this, in, in this region of the world? Uh, I may be a bit cynical or, or provocative, but if we start by just applying what we have learned over the past 40 years, that would already be a big deal. And we are rehashing, I mean, talked about it this morning, but we are rehashing so much at the moment, uh, or reinventing the wheel. I mean, it's, it's crazy. It's, it's just, just the same stuff over and over again. Uh, it's very difficult to be creative enough at the moment to actually find something new to research. Uh, so I think, I mean, I'm not sure if we still need disasters. I understand the point about doing, I mean, having the vehicle for doing, for publishing more, but I'm not sure if it's, if it's actually, Okay, okay, we know, and now how do we translate that into, into <laughs> policy and practice? And that's going to be my final word. Thanks. Thank you very Thanks. much, Stacey. Uh, a very pro provocative and stimulating contribution. I especially like your, your last point about reinventing the wheel. And it struck me, actually, when Ian was speaking, um, in reinventing the wheel, we often leave out some crucial element that was of the original. So um, something to think about and come back to at the qu in the questions. Uh, so moving on, I'd like to talk to um, I'd like to turn to um, Erisema. Um, so in your part of the world, Erisema, how has the study of disasters evolved? Um, in the 20th century, there were four flooding disasters on average yearly in your region. Have you seen an improvement in the way these disasters have been managed? Well, thank you very much, Helen, and it is a big privilege to be here today with all of you. Thank you very much. Well, in the case of our region, um, the study of disasters goes back to the decade of the 19th. Uh, and perhaps the most influential contribution was led by LARET, the network of social studies in the prevention of disasters in Latin America. LARET was founded in August 1992 in Costa Rica. And uh, it is a group of researchers, governor officials uh, and practitioners aiming at integrated research, practice, coordination, education, and political advocacy. Uh, La Red was integrated or has been integrated not only from people from Latin America, which is very interesting. Many of the contribution, contributors are from the UK precisely, and, and the United Nations, and USA. For example, we have uh, Andrew Mascri, Alan Lavelle, Anthony Oliver Smith, Ben Wisner, that I just lost him. Ah, he's there. <laughs> and um, well, uh, they really promote the understanding of disaster and disaster risk as a social construct. And they were based on bringing together the approaches from the natural and social sciences in that early stage to understand disasters. Um, I could say that the concept of risk, thanks to the work they develop, was transformed from a physical deterministic notion into the paradigm that recognizes the social construction of risk. Um, these contributions, of course, were inspired, and, and, and uh, there was always a, a feedback by the works carried out by uh, Davis, Hewitt, Ian Burton, and other pioneering uh, colleagues in, in disasters. Um, there are many contributions that they, ha they carried out along the years, but I just would like to point out some of the seminal concepts that they provided, not only for the Latin American region, but for the whole world. And, and these are more or less in chronological order. Disasters are not natural, the work by Andrew Mascari, who doesn't know that work. The importance of a small and medium disasters that nowadays is, is being taken back 
to the arena of the discussion, but that was mentioned since 1994 by, by this group. The creation of the Simbentar, uh, which is not a, a, a normal database. It is a disaster information management system that was uh, organized to analyze disaster impacts and trends. But the difference was that since the very beginning was at local level, which is of major relevance. Other topics included involuntary displacement and resettlement induced by disasters, the risk of, as a social construction, historical and social processes, the intrinsic relationships between risk development and environment, which is of, of major relevance, socio-natural hazards, the significance of local management of disaster risk by Wilch Chauks, extensive and intensive risk, the holistic approach for risk and vulnerability. Well, regardless of the language, uh, the contributions have been focused since Yokohama to the Sendai Framework of Disaster uh, Risk Reduction in 2015. Uh, they have published a lot of uh, books and the, most importantly, the first journal on disasters in the region of, of Latin America was published by La Red, uh, that was uh, Disasters and Society. Uh, and they have influenced uh, very important key documents international levels, like the special report on the extreme events <laughs> and um, disasters for the IPCC, and of course the UNISDR global assessment reports. When we talk about flooding um, and, and see the news every day in the world, we, we can maybe play at finding synonyms and, this, and, and the, the ones that I found are urbanization and deforestation. We need not to forget that Latin America is not only a region that is prone to natural hazards. Society is very complex, and uh, their economy formation was somehow influenced by the colonial past. So we have a, an economy that is strongly linked to constant increase of the rate of destruction of natural resources, in a society with an increasing incidence of poverty and social inequality that lacks of strategic policies for territorial management. So everywhere in Latin America, we have the incidence of processes of social deteriorations and environmental degradation. And perhaps there have been some improvements in the way the response or the evacuation takes place during flooding but we real no, are not there yet in terms of disaster risk management. If we do not address risk drivers uh, from an integrative uh, perspective, we are not going to change anything. Uh, less people is dying because of floods and other disasters, but more people is getting more and more vulnerable every day. So we have the impact of uh, plenty of hurricanes this, this, this time of the year. It is very easy to see the, uh, the news uh, every day. And uh, I don't think uh, that, that the disaster studies have really um, uh, contributed to a change of uh, political will and, and territorial management uh, improvement. Thank you very much, Hiroshima. Um, thank you for reminding us about these social dimensions of disaster risk and also sharing with us um, about some of the work of the networks of social studies um, you're working with. Um, I should add that um, earlier on, I think we were described as a club, but what struck me coming here today is I'm sitting on a panel with three people I've not ever met before. So, and I think we're hearing about how this club is expanding and your network is one example of that. Um, so I'd now like to turn to uh, Professor Lan Shui. Uh, we all remember the 2003 SARS outbreak, the 2008 Sichuan earthquake, and most recently the, the impact of the typhoon uh, last month. Um, how has the study of disasters over evolved over time in China, and what are some of the emerging trends that you have seen? Okay. Well, uh, thanks very much. Uh, first of all, I'm honored to be here, and also congratulations to the journal for the 40th anniversary. It, it, it happens that actually China's reform 
uh, reform and openness, uh, you know, started in the late 70s also. It's uh, next year, it's the 40th anniversary. So it's, uh, it's uh, quite a coincidence. I think that the reform has really brought very broad change, uh, very major transitions in China. Uh, it can be summarized in four major transitions. One is the economic system is changing uh, from a uh, planned system to a market-based system. And the, the, industrial, uh, the industrial structure uh, uh, is, uh, is changing from a very much sort of agricultural-based, uh, agricultural and manufacturing-based to one increasingly uh, service-based uh, economy. And by, uh, I think, uh, uh, two years ago, a service is the first time that it's uh, over half of China's uh, GDP. Uh, the third major change is societal change. Uh, Chinese society was increasingly becoming an urban society now. Uh, over more than uh, uh, half of the population lives uh, in, in urban areas compared to about only 20% at the beginning of the reform. And the last one is the governance system change has also changed dramatically from a from one that is very much based on personal uh, charisma and authority to one that's increasingly based on efficiency and participation. So those four major uh, changes have brought great benefits to the Chinese society, but also actually created a lot of new challenges and risks to the Chinese society. And that's actually where we are actually turning to the uh, how you know, the Chinese society have changed in terms of uh, uh, the studies on disasters. I think in Chinese context, when we talk about disasters, we uh, generally uh, tend to you know, bring them into four groups. The first one is uh, uh, natural uh, disasters. The second one is industrial accidents. And the third one is public health events. And the last one is uh, social unrest. So those four major groups are all you know, what we call the, uh, so the you know, public emergencies. And so that's so the, you know, the, what we, we, we often, uh, you know, in terms of our study, we would bring them together. I think if you look at the studies in, in, in the disasters, uh, it, it can be generally described in, in three phases. The first phase is really, you know, from the funding of uh, People's Republic of China in 1949 until 2003. I, you know, I sort of term that as the first generation of, uh, of research on, on uh, disasters. It's very much so silo-based. So basically, you know, there are people who are lo looking at the flood control, and there are people who are looking at the, uh, the mining uh, you know, accidents and, and, and so on, but not linked together at all. And also very much based on, you know, sort of more technical studies and so on. Uh, so in 2003, the SARS event uh, really served as a sort of wake-up call for Chinese society, although it's a you know, sort of public health event, but the implication is much broader. So I think that's the first time that uh, uh, the Chinese society began to you know, recognize this is a much broader phenomenon that ought to be, de you know, to be dealt with in, in a more systematic way. So I think that's the time that, um, uh, uh, the, first of all, the scholars from all fields so, you know, jumped in into uh, looking at these issues, and also the government responded by uh, um, uh, creating a sort of more of a, 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 a what I call the second generation of an emergency management system, which is now sometimes being termed as uh, as one plan and, and and three mechanisms. The one plan is that um, is so called the emergency management plan. So now almost. Uh, at every level of the government and, and you know agencies and institutions, they have to have a set of emergency plans in uh, pr in preparation for responding to various various kinds of uh, uh, disasters. So that that's a system that has been widely um, implemented. And the second, uh, there are three mechanisms, including the first of all, the legal uh, mechanism. Uh, China passed a, um, a law on uh, emergency management in, in the year of 2006. And uh, the second uh, mechanism is a, uh, more of the institutional mechanism. Uh, at the, every level of government, and there is a, an office of emergency management, which is coordinating uh, you know, the response to various kind of emergencies. And the third mechanism is more of an operational mechanism. So there's a, a set of operational procedures that um, has been uh, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 implemented throughout the uh, you know, various kind of response agencies so that actually they can be, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, raised, they can improve their efficiency over the, uh, when they respond to various kind of emergencies. So I think that you know, so-called one plan and three mechanisms has improved the uh, 
uh, you know, uh, efficiency and uh, effectiveness in, in responding to various kind of emergencies over the la uh, last, uh, uh, you know, uh, decade or so. Uh, I think now there are, of course, I think there are uh, uh, now in terms of looking at, uh, you know, what, what are the uh, uh, challenges and, uh, and issues. I think, first of all, I think the major challenge is there's a tension uh, between the technical groups and, all, and social uh, scientists, because I think social science looks things uh, differently than the more technical groups, and, and so there are always, you know, whether we should have in, deploy the best technologies or whether we should really try to change the institution. So those are sort of one uh, tension that sometimes you see. There are also, I think, the between the academic groups and also the practitioners. Uh, I think we talked about the journal. Uh, I think also there are uh, many uh, Chinese journals related to uh, emergency management. But I think currently, I think most of the academic publications are still in the traditional fields. But they, there, are, there are a few uh, new journals on emergency management, but that's more of a, for practitioners. So I think there's some um, attention of, of, of trying to convert those into uh, more of uh, academic ones, but I think there's also strong resistance. And the third one, I think that um, uh, also relate to our previous speakers, is the publication, academic publications in Chinese journals or in uh, English-based international journals. Uh, I think that this is an, a much broader issue that you know, I hope we have more chance to, to, to talk about. I think now increasingly, I think Chinese academics are um, <coughs> publishing internationally. And so that's actually uh, uh, creating a lot of pressure. And so everybody wants trying to publish in, in international journals, including the disasters. But at the same time, the practitioners, uh, they can only read in mostly in Chinese. So I think people are now, some people are arguing, saying, Look, you know, we are spending more uh, money in, in doing research, and the best research is first published in international journals, but not in the local journals. And, and that's actually unfair to the local pr practitioners. So how do you with, deal with this issue? That's another challenge that we're facing. Let me stop here. Thank you very much. Um, very interesting to hear about these challenges, which, of course, for, for many of us are very familiar in the other parts of the world um, where we're working. Um, Lastly, I'd like to turn to uh, Professor Luca Biongdeng, who is joining us from Washington. Um, in your region of the world, uh, the Horn of Africa, um, it, as we know, it's been particularly plagued by issues of food insecurity, conflict, and migration. And um, I would welcome your thoughts on how the study of disasters has evolved over time. Thank you. Uh, first, uh, Helen, uh, thank you very much. It's good to, that we see you from a distance. And, um, and, and also for ODI, for organizing this important event. I'm so happy that you have picked the region, the Horn of Africa. And, uh, and I think just to start uh, from the, uh, the, the debate about the research policy and, and practice divide, I think these are very so relevant in, in, in the Horn of Africa. And I would say Horn of Africa contributed in the theorization of the vulnerability and famine. And, and one point I want to start with, there's no doubt the, the evolution of a study in this Horn of Africa contributed a lot. So you have a wealth of knowledge and experience in terms of the research. What is missing is the practice. In the 70s, the same countries facing with the, with the great uh, droughts and famine in the 70s and 80s, Exactly the same countries today are facing famine and, 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 and high level of food insecurity. And this is raising a very question that to what level, what is the learning curve, whether from the, uh, the, the donors, from the international community, but indeed even from the, the national institutions. But the other element, what you highlighted is the issue of policies. What is happening in this region now the, the, the issue of a state itself becoming a source of vulnerability of citizens and the whole lot of institutions. So it's not, it's not about, so it's coming back to the whole debate about the role of a state itself. If you look in this country of the Horn of Africa today, the issues of quality of governance and access to justice is becoming a big issue that is creating, making people even more vulnerable. South Sudan is a good example of this. 
But let me come now to the, uh, the, the level of exposure. Let me come to specific areas of exposure uh, of this region to the disasters. FAO, in 19, estimated in 1996 to 2010, this region was having about 86 disasters, whether human, human made or natural disasters. So is the region having the highest level of, of the year uh, of the uh, of the uh, of disasters? On average, almost six disasters per year. And 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 the second one, the outcomes of this one, is this the whole of Africa is not only food insecure, most of these countries are fragile, but uh, and 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 uh, and even famine occurring once every decade. So it's asking. So, so this is this is a very, a very, a very region that is really very, very exposed to this. But what are the uh, why this region is so vulnerable? I think seventy percent of this region is arid and and semi-arid region. It is a, a region with a high population of pastoralists, and you could see the vulnerability of, of the pastoralists. And as I mentioned earlier, the issue of protracted crisis. But one aspect of this characteristic of this, of this uh, region is the whole of the population demographic changes, very big, and the coming was to the Mycelian, uh, Malthusian theory of uh, catastrophe. And I think we need to refocus this issue of the population and the, last lot of the whole lot of quality of governance and the uh, institutional and the width of institution. But let me come to this, the to what level this Horn of Africa contributed in the in the evolution of study in of, of disasters. I think you can remember in the 70s, the drought, the great famine in the 70s and 80s, resulted in a whole lot of coping, coping strategies, which actually being challenged to the level now this the sin entitlement theory was talking basically about the, the Sahelian famine. And which actually resulted also to some of the discussion about the swift acid vulnerability, not only to expand the debate around rather disaster being seen as an economic disaster to, to more than, than that, especially looking at the issues of intangible, uh, intangible uh, uh, acids. But even the, uh, uh, the, the whole lot of social dimension with LS risk, uh, uh, social risk management, and then a school livelihood approach. But in 80s and in 90s, the whole lot of conflict the, the protracted crisis emerged, and, 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 and this region contributed to the debate about the whole lot of complex emergency by, by different. This is what I think the, the whole lot of access to power becoming a very, a very important. So I, I, I want to say it is a region that will continue to challenge our thinking in terms of, the, uh, of disasters, and we're going to see, to see more. And I think the biggest question for me, and especially for this region, is the role of the state is going to be a real challenge for the, uh, for, for the way we manage disasters. I think we have a lot of community uh, knowledge about the disasters. I think what is missing is the role of the state and the policies, which I think this is the, uh, the, the, the challenge that is facing this region. Uh, let me stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um... I'm sorry that you all had to stop because I could have carried on listening to you for a lot longer. Um, let, me, let me have a second round, uh, ask you a simple question and give us an opportunity to hear more from you before I turn to the audience for questions. So I'd like to ask each of you, reflecting on your, your respective experiences in the four regions, why do you think the study of disasters has managed to stay important and relevant today? Why should people continue to be concerned? Um, and let, let us start again with JC. Hmm. Um, I mean, as I said, I mean, I, I think now we've come to the point that it's more a matter of translating the research into policy and practice than, than actually generating generating uh, heaps of new uh, projects and new researches. I mean, there may be niches where research is needed, uh, but overall, I think, I mean, if we could apply, uh, I'm even half or less than half of what we've learned by reading disasters over the past uh, 40 years, I'm sure we would make a, 
uh, a much more significant impact than just generating new research. Apply what we already know, learn from the past. Thank you. Who would like to go next? Well, I, I, I agree with Daisy. I think uh, we have really to mind the gap between science and practice. I think that's one of the major challenges. And although we are flooded with the natural hazard studies, and also uh, recently um, um, early warning systems, I think that mass media is playing a significant role in the thinking of the population. Since we have a lot of access to what is happening all over the world, I think people can start to, to understand the, the, the role of vulnerability. I think by looking at the consequences in terms of human, environmental, and economic impacts all over the world, I, I have the hope that people <coughs> could start making a shift in, in the way they behave, in the way we, uh, we are part of this planet, and, and the way we need to, to harmonize with, uh, with the environment. So um, for that, however, it would be very important for, for us to make sure that mass media understand the process of disaster risk because although they provide information about the consequences, we still uh, live in a, in a world where disasters are considered natural. So that doesn't help to the people to, to understand that we need a, a change to reduce vulnerability, to reduce exposure, to have uh, an adequate territorial management. And I think we need to focus on, on that and, and to try to make the best of it. Thank you. OK. Yeah, uh, I think that three. I, I seems to me there are three reasons uh, that we is still uh, highly relevant. I think despite the, all the progress we made, uh, we have not really been able to get rid of the sort of the uh, particular kind of risk or disasters. And actually, there are more. Think about the new technologies, say in AI and so on, the potential risks that might bring to the society. So actually, there are increasingly more and more, and so that makes it you know. Uh, a lot, you know, increasingly, you know, uh, um, uh, the uh, social, you know, risks that may, makes our society increasingly more vulnerable. So I, we, we feel there's a need to study uh, those uh, phenomena. And the second is that um, it's so complex. So if you think about all the, you know, no matter whether it's, a, whether it's a, uh, you know, natural disasters or industrial accidents and so on, it has to uh, bring a lot of the you know people from different disciplines and to understand the phenomenon and to see how we can best to address it and we still have not been able to to do so. The third, I think, there's a in, inherently there's so, sort of a governance uh, failure in addressing this issue. For example, I think we all know uh, prevention is the best, and we all know that you know we should really invest now to prevent the, um, uh, the, the, the you know disaster from happening in the future. Unfortunately. Every country, every region, I think, well, you know, very severely underinvested in uh, risk prevention. Why? I think it's very clear from the governance point of view, no government would be willing to spend current money for uh, preventing something that's going to happen in, in, the, in the future, which may go beyond their, uh, you know, governance terms. So I think that uh, uh, just for those three simple reasons, I think there, uh, there's probably still uh, very much need uh, for, for doing that work. Can you just add something? Sure. Following on the policy issue. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I'm sorry. JC, go ahead, and then we'll turn to, then we will turn yeah. to Luca. Um, I mean, if we look at the Philippines and the policy changes we've seen over the past uh, eight years, I mean, in the new uh, uh, legal framework we, we have now, and that was passed in 2010, it was not significantly affected by research over the past two decades, it was more affected by what Ben mentioned earlier, which is lobbying by civil society organizations, banding together with academics, so the academics were there through a network which we call the Disaster Risk Reduction Network Philippines, and that's the coming together of all these stakeholders, led by the civil society, lobbying the government, and before the passing of the law, we will all text our, our uh, congressmen and senators to actually make things change. It was, it, research was part of it, but it was not led by research. Policy change didn't happen because of research. I want to ask you a question. Was that written up 
in terms of what to, to share that wider learning on that process? Because that seems to me a very important topic for, for learning, the impact of that kind of networking and research and engaging with stakeholders. Not really. I know a Philippine student who's kind of writing about it at the moment, but it's part of a thesis, but it's not really it's not been not yet. It's to my knowledge. Mm. Okay, thank you. Uh, Luca, can we turn to you and give you the floor? Yeah, yeah. thank you very much. I, uh, I, I, I think the, the relevance of the uh, study of disasters is quite, uh, uh, quite important, and I think I want to, to highlight some few points here. I think at a certain point, we're talking of famine to be issue of the of the past. And what we are seeing now, we are seeing a new pattern of new famines emerging. And I think itself to keep us aware that the the, the vulnerability is a real one. It's been famine today is becoming a, a plan. And then also to deepen our understanding of the civil war and conflict. Is that these are phenomena that they, whether drawn, but the, 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 the debate around the conflict, it may need to take us what new famine are we going to see? And given the fact now, this conflict and political instability shifting to the earth, linked to the urbanization. And the whole lot of linkages between the disaster, uh, between the disasters and the process and outcomes. I think we may, this is the recent work by the WFP on the link between food insecurity, migration, and conflict is quite important because it's actually bring in new thinking about what's happening. But I think some of the concern, the issue of migration, I think migration is going to pose a real challenge. It's not a challenge to the recipient and the, uh, and the or, countries of origin, but it's even questioning the whole our global values and, and, and conscience. Uh, in a, the, what I could say, the retreat of West from, from, from that commitment to the global commitment. And migration is going to create a lot, a lot of issues to the year, uh, whether globally, but even regionally. The second one, inequality. I think inequality, not only in the developed countries, but even in the year. Uh, and the, 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 the debate now, people may come to a situation whereby, why should we care really about somebody dying in South Sudan. And if that one is happening, I agree that the, the issue of uh, the civil society and global consciousness of civil society, I think is quite powerful, but I think this is something that people need to focus on. The last one, the, the reliance of these commodity prices. I think if we projected the whole lot of the countries depending on oil, especially whether in, in globally, we are seeing a clear case these, these prices of these commodities are going to be a really big challenge. That is going to create a big problem, political instability in, uh, in some of these countries. Let me stop. Thank you to all of the panelists. Um, I'd now like to turn to the, the Q&A with yourselves um, and also to mention that we have upwards of 100 people listening online. So I want to make sure that we also give the opportunity um, for them to ask questions. And also, because they're listening online, I would ask if you could keep it concise and brief, but also try to speak very clearly so that they can hear. Um, now, I'll take questions in groups of four, and I would ask that you state your name and an organization um, so that we all know who you are. Okay, so who would like to start? I think we have one here. Thank you. I am David Alexander from University College London, and I would like to bring the discussion back to Disasters Journal. In disaster studies, we are encouraged to look at root causes. We seldom do that for ourselves, and yet the world academic system is teetering on the brink of a major catastrophe with substantial implications for humanity as a whole. Perhaps many of us don't feel that because we are in insulated from it, but it is a fact. And the reason is that neoliberalism, a fanatical obsession with money and the audit culture are taking over the root matter there is that co co uh, competition replaces collaboration. The very existence of Disasters Journal is a testimony and its success also to the value of collaboration. And yet we face a situation in which competition is becoming an overwhelming factor. 
it was asked, why is work not used? Why is good published research not implemented? Well, one reason, in fact, is because you need local academics to present it to the potential users because they have the networks, the recognition, and so on. And yet what we tend to find, and I grapple with this problem every day of my life, is that competition is such that, by and large, we kick the local academics back down the ladder rather than helping them up. And that is a great pity. It's a very important issue. Is there a question in there? What do you think of that? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. OK. I believe Ilan. And that isn't a license to say what you like and then ask what to think. <laughs> Ilan Kalman, University College London. How can we get rid of the phrase natural disaster? Thank you. I see we have one here, and let me take some from the back. One right at the back. I'm a PhD researcher. Is it working? I'm a PhD researcher at the Flood Hazard Research Centre. And uh, my question is about what advice would you give to young researchers to bridge this science policy gap? OK. And um, if we take this gentleman. <coughs> yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Marcus Oxley, and I'm with the uh, Global Network for Disaster Reduction, a civil society network. And it's a question for... Professor Lang Zhu, um, it, it's just um, your reflections really, as China is transitioning from a more of a planned economy to a more market uh, demand driven economy, w what do you think the implications of that in this kind of urbanization process where in a market economy inevitably we tend to live in yesterday's city because we never, we never plan ahead to design our urban developments are kind of ahead of the curve. We're always behind the curve because it's much more of a demand-driven type of economy. And, and to me, a planned economy potentially has an advantage to get ahead of that curve. So just having seen both and seen how things are changing, I'm just interested on your reflections on that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now, who would like to start? Um, the first question we had about why is research not used? I mean, that actually seems like it might be relevant to you, JC. Do I see you taking the, the bit? Or would anyone else like to take that question? I'll go for the second one. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'm going to use the counter example of my Philippine example, which is New Zealand. Because it, it's, it's working in New Zealand somehow where you have researchers influencing policy. Uh, it's working because it's a very small country. Everyone knows everyone. Uh, funding for research, interestingly, is increasingly uh, negotiated. Uh, we, we have still uh, contestable funding, don't worry. Uh, but we increasingly have negotiated funding. Uh, because we only have seven universities, all are well connected to policymakers, especially if you're in Wellington, you just go down the road and knock at the door of the ministry and you get your money. Um, and the NGOs are part of the same game as well. So it's, it's more based on personal relationship and personal rapport. Uh, people knowing each other, and that's how it works. But it's a very small country and a very specific environment. Um, and I can see that kind of happening in some countries in the Pacific as well, somehow. Um, but yeah, more about what you said, David going to see the, the policymakers and building trust. I mean, trust is, is, is an issue, and how do you open up the dialogue in the first place is, is another question, which is a tricky one. Thank you. If we move on to the second question, um, I think there was a lot of agreement that disasters are not natural, but this seems like the perfect topic for you, Rasema. Would you like to comment? Yes, of course. How to get rid of that? Thank you for the question. Well, to be honest, I get very frustrated when I go to conferences related to disasters and the presentations talk about uh, natural disasters. And I just really come to my uh, classes, my teaching, I say, well, 
every student that says natural disasters in the in the classroom of course i had explained that uh, the, the reason before is is is, uh, is is failing of course the course that's 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 a fact that's a rule in fact yeah it's a, it's a rule in, in my class but well maybe i'm going to give some a bit utopic ideas but First of all, I would bring an um, updated version of uh, Disasters Are Not Natural with uh, new contributions so that uh, it can be uh, disseminated in, in, in the journals and everywhere. I would uh, promote a strong campaign during, during the conference related to disasters on which there are signs or, I don't know, videos or something saying disasters are not natural because if the scientific community, the academics, we do not really stand for that, what can we expect from everybody else? Um, I would say that it would be also uh, useful uh, in the way uh, we can uh, influence that is to, to try to, uh, to look at the DRR programs that we teach, for example, for masters or PhDs and, and so on, and try to make sure that, that the, the natural disasters are not there. I think perhaps the most effective measure could be to educate mass media, because if they really talk about disasters and, and, and explain why they are not natural, that will help us a lot. And one that is a minor one, but could also be of uh, significance in, is to ban publications or not to accept papers that talk about natural disasters, as simple as that. When I review papers that lead with natural disasters, I just say, no, fail. So that, that, that is my Thank you. Thing. That would provide yeah. us with a very easy criteria. <laughs> for our reviews. Um, on the third, on the, the last area, um, the comments from Marcus about in a market economy, it's difficult to plan ahead because it's demand driven. Your reflections? Uh, I, I think, in a way, I think the transition, indeed, there's a lot of implications for uh, disaster uh, you know, management. I think, if, uh, it, it, first of all, indeed, as you, you said, that in, in a planned economy, I think it's probably easier to plan ahead and, and be able to address some of the, the, the potential uh, problems. Uh, um, but at the same time, there are also uh, many uh, you know, uh, failures in, in terms of addressing some of the underlying issues that, that I will not belabor you at this, you know, this place. But I think the transition indeed uh, brought many new challenges for uh, preventing uh, disasters. One example is in the industrial accidents. Uh, in, in the past, in the planned economy, I think the, actually the industrial pr production, I think it was, a, it was very much sort of, you know, very well planned and they were indeed so the government agency in charge of that and so on. And it's very much easy to be controlled because the, most of the enterprises are, are uh, SOEs, state-owned enterprises. So they follow whatever the rules. Once you made the transition into a market-based economy, there are many, you know, so the companies and, and so on, they are, you know, doing a lot of, you know, productions that not following the, uh, you know, not co uh, complying with the government regulations. And it's very hard to find those, you know, uh, 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 cases. And uh, so the, in a way, the regulation becomes a huge challenge in a market-based economy uh, in, in the uh, disaster area. That's why you probably have seen, uh, you know, I think in the 90s and the early 2000s, there were a lot of industrial accidents in, in China. <laughs> That's not by coincidence. It's the government system have not really, uh, you know, uh, uh, caught up with the, the new situation. Uh, I think there's also, but, but at the same time, I think the market also brings a lot of new tools that the government could have used in terms of, you know, addressing a lot of these, uh, uh, you know, disasters. For example, I think insurance can be a very uh, valuable uh, tool in the disaster area that have not been very well used in, in China and many other traditional countries. And so I think there's a mix of, uh, it's, it's more of a, you know, not, uh, you know, good or bad, but rather how do you combine the, the role of, you know, the, the, the positive role of the, of the government and the, also the, the positive role of the market and, and make a good balance. Thank you. 
Um, I'd like to turn to Luca, and I'd very much like to hear your advice for the younger researchers or the PhD researchers about um, bridging the gap between policy and yeah. practice. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Helen. I think let me go for the, if you don't mind, the issue of local, uh, the local academia or researchers. Because this is, this is something I, I experienced in myself when, when, when at Yuba University. I think we may need to look at it from to what level can we create a demand for research for the local researchers. And I think we can, definitely the issue of funding is quite a very big issue. One of the things that we have been pushing, most of these local researchers, they have a lot of limitations in terms of resources. And I think some of these donors, if they could, there are a lot of investment, a lot of resources for research for non-Indigenous people or non-African doing research on behalf of them. I think the donors have a, a role to play in that, in terms of attaching any research to be done in the, in the continent or in the, these countries to have a partnership with the local researchers. I think this is something that it can easily be done. The second one, the research, in, especially in the context of Horn of Africa, if I take the issue of South Sudan, it seems to be challenging the establishment, challenging the state. I think one of the problems that the, the local researcher may need to do is to navigate with this reality that you are having. It is not having an evidence that can make you you have to navigate with the with the with the with the policymakers. Sometimes becoming so so difficult. I'm one of the people becoming a victim when I try to create an, an atmosphere discussing public issues on the university, and then the government was so irritated and then was so angry to the level that I I was I was forced to leave the country. But it's, it's more of myself. Even how should I should have done it differently? And so, so, so I think the whole lot of the state is very important. The last one is to fill the gap. I, one of my experience, and especially in the context of Africa, civil society, becoming a real, real force. If there's something that is that can really bring a change in civil society, one of the problem is that instead of dealing directly with the policymakers, with the government, sometimes they don't have time. They are not even ready to do. Simplification of these, these whatever findings is very important. But civil society is the one that actually sharing the, the, uh, the results or the research with the civil society, they can use them as a very effective tool to bridge this divide between the policy and, uh, and, and research. Thank you. Could I add just to that? Yeah, I, let, let me just add to the uh, you know to, to the comment. I, I think on the on the particular on the, on the partnership issue, I totally agree with you that indeed actually, the, in terms of the you know how to um, uh, you know in terms of support the uh, academics uh, doing policy work in in the developing countries, the partnership is very important. I think here I think indeed the donors uh, I, I think um, support I think uh, you know it's, it's quite crucial. I, I used to serve on the board of uh, IDRC for uh, quite a number of years. IDRC had a, 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 a program uh, called the Think Tank Initiative. I think that initiative, I think, I think is very useful. Basically, it's really supporting the institutional, the capacity of the uh, you know, think tanks in developing countries. And it's really uh, you know, supporting its capacity. And instead of supporting individual projects, so that actually, you know, based on that, you can develop your, you know, uh, capacity further. So I just want to add to that. Thank you. A great extra comment. Thank you. Um, and I think this also reflects some of one of the trends that we've seen, whereby previously we were talking about partnerships between practitioners and researchers, but now we're extending into local networks, networks of local researchers. And it, it comes back to what JC was saying about who is setting the research agendas. Because while there might be more money for research, for other people's agendas, to get that support for those local networks and what is what is the research that's demanded locally is actually still a huge challenge. Um, can, I, can I just yeah. pick on that? Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, we are seeing that trend happening at the moment. I mean, having local researchers being involved in projects, but often it's tokenistic. Yeah, exactly. uh, who leads the publication in the end? <coughs> mostly Western researchers. <coughs> and uh, I mean, if you look at the room here, we mostly have Western researchers and we have all done research 
overseas in less wealthy countries. Uh, how much are we willing to have uh, researchers from these countries coming and helping us uh, doing research in our own country? How would the Italian volcanologist or French volcanologist welcome Philippine or Indonesian volcanologists supporting their research on their own volcanoes? And I'm taking this example, this is the ultimate kind of private garden thing. Uh, could we have Mexican researchers doing research on floods in, in the UK? Or, or, I mean, it's a whole thing. <laughs> okay, I will take... Um, the, 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 there was the, the question of the PhD student. Oh, yes, mm -hmm. the I? question of the PhD student, but then do feel free to come back. Okay, well, it's a very difficult question, of course, because we haven't solved it yet for us. But I would say that you need to look for transdisciplinary experiences since the early ages of your study. Also, you need to learn the language of the policymakers, and many of us do not know that language. And, and thirdly, it is important to understand how policymakers think so that we really can communicate to each other because it's, it's not talking about science in, in the way we do, it is trying to to, to transfer the, 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 the message, not, not the, the technicisms we use. So I would guess the best way to do is, is to try to get involved into a thinking and a way of communication that is uh, used by, by the policymakers. Any more advice for the young researchers from our panel? Could I? Yes. Well, I, I think actually, uh, if you, you want to get, <laughs> my advice is that um, uh, it's probably not easy to do a PhD thesis in in disaster research. Uh, I you know I, I think the disaster research is very much you need to have a lot of experience. You need to have a lot of uh, you know sort of a, uh, uh, practice in the field in order to really to get the insights. So I think that um, it, it's not an easy field to do PhD work in 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 in, in, in that. So I think that uh, uh, you know, if I were <laughs> providing any advice, I would say that maybe uh, stay away from doing a PhD thesis in it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, Thank you. Need, try to um, be provocative. I think we have <laughs> very much. We have two comments relating to that question, so <laughs> let me take them. Okay. Um, so my name is Mike Aronson, and I chair the strategic advisory group for the Global Challenges Research Fund. And I just wanted to be sure, make sure that everybody in this room and everybody listening to this conversation online is aware that the Global Challenges Research Fund is designed to address a number of the questions that have been raised. So it is explicit in the criteria of funding. But this is a not inconsiderable sum of money. This is one and a half billion pounds available uh, of UK government uh, research funding available for research into development challenges, including what they call agile response to emergencies. Um, but explicit in the criteria are a number of things. One is building a community between researchers, policymakers, and practitioners. Two is um, building genuine partnerships between researchers in northern uh, and southern institutions um, and not you know, just the sort of tokenistic ones that we're all, all familiar with. And thirdly, is actually providing opportunities for early career researchers to, um, to build their careers on transdisciplinary research, um, <coughs> addressing global development challenges. So this is actually a really important initiative for this community to take advantage of. Uh, and I've tweeted it, actually. So, you know, there's a link to the to the GCRF website. I really do encourage everybody to take a look at it. This is what it is intended to achieve. Thank you. Another comment from Ian. Uh, Ian Davis from um, Oxford Brookes University. Um, just a comment for this PhD student. The, the paper that I gave, which was in the first issue of Disasters, it was the subject of a lot of discussion with my professor, Konigsberger, at DPU in UCL. I said, if I'm going to do this paper, which is they want a very, it's going to take, distract me for probably about a month and a half. He said, he said, you've got to understand something when you're doing a PhD. He said, I'm your supervisor. If you start writing, you're going to collect supervisors all over the world. It, people are going to read it. They're going to write letters to you. And suddenly, you've got an army of people interested in your work, perhaps. And that's exactly what happened. 
the more I wrote, uh, it took me 12 years, mind you, to do this blasted PhD. That's probably why. <laughs> but, but, but the more I wrote uh, interim conference papers, letters to journals, all that stuff, I got feedback. And, uh, and so I would, I would uh, advise you to write as widely as possible en route while you're doing it and getting uh, comment back, and that's going to enrich you and also build your future career. Your career could be built by that process. Thank you. Thank you. And I also feel I have to respond to that comment because I get it asked all the time from masters and doctoral students at Tufts. Ten years ago, I would have said, wait and go and work for an NGO first and get some experience. But now I actually wouldn't say that because I realise that you wouldn't necessarily get the kind of experience you need to do a, to do a doctorate. And my advice would be, you have to find a way to really understand the context where you are working. And this does, doesn't just apply to Western doctoral students. It could equally apply to doctoral students, say, in Khartoum. Because just because they're in the same country doesn't mean to say they have any more understanding than anyone else. And un until you have that deeper context of both the theory and the lived experience of people in the literature, I think it's very difficult to engage in any research doctoral research. Even if you're doing statistical analysis, you have to understand the context in which the data is collected. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, I will now turn online. Um, we have a question here uh, from Anna von Secker, who is working in disaster waste management in the UK. And her question is directed to you, JC. She says, I do agree with the priorities issues, although if you think in a disaster scenario, not only for research purposes, those priorities usually are not established by the international organisation, but by the government itself. I've had a few cases where the priority areas to intervene were not exactly the most affected or vulnerable. With your experience, how can we actually intervene in the most affected and vulnerable areas? And I think that might also um, be relevant to some of our other panelists. Is it in a post-disaster setting? Or? Um, it's in a, I think it's in a disaster setting, yes. So it's how do we influence the, uh, it's basically, the research agenda? Uh, I, I think it's more about intervention, actually. Um, yeah, it's talking mm. about how to ensure that interventions are actually targeting or working in the most affected and vulnerable areas. Um, and I, I guess the, to think about how, how the research can inform that. It takes us back to um, what we discussed just before in terms of the knowledge of the context and, and, and who leads the research. Uh, and I think it's particularly sensitive post-disaster. Um, where we have, you should be careful with the wording, but I call this a gold rush of researchers usually because there's a huge potential for publications immediately after disasters. Um, not really for the benefits of the locals, but for the benefits of academic careers. Um, but I mean, if we have the local researchers leading that process, uh, the research becomes legitimate. And it's a matter of, of legitimacy. Who, who is legitimate to actually, uh, I don't really like the word intervene or intervention, but who is who's actually uh, um, legitimate to lead the process and engage with the policymakers and the practitioners on the ground, knowing the local context? And again, it takes us back <coughs> to local researchers and local practitioners. Can I add the comment? Uh, I I'd like to just to, to, to so that in a way I think to also to look at this issue from from a slightly different uh, perspective. I think it doesn't really I think for a lot of local context it doesn't really matter whether the publication is uh, led by you know uh, by uh, you know the the uh, scholars from developed countries or developing countries, but rather it's more of the uh, who's uh, you know sort of in a way. Uh, uh, so lead it drives the the, the, so the, the the policy and drives the you know the uh, uh, direction uh, of the problem. So I think the local, the indigenous capacity, the indigenous capability, is is crucially important. I think for many um, uh, developing countries, 
uh, I think that uh, you know, so the so the, uh, indigenous capability, uh, you know, is lacking, and I think the learning is still. I think it's a, it's a great way. Uh, you know, learning particularly is, is through collaboration. Um, uh, maybe that indeed there. You know, you you have to to pay some, you know, pay you pay your your tuitions, but hopefully through that you you are not really totally dependent. You, you rather you, you learn from that and then developing your uh, in, in indigenous capability. I, I think that's where how you sort of try to balance the two. Uh, it's somehow changing as well because many agencies, especially development agencies, providing scholarships uh, <coughs> with disasters and DRR on top of their priorities. So I mean, RZ and NZ aid, for example, in Australia and New Zealand, uh, we are bringing heaps of researchers from Southeast Asia and the Pacific to do research in their own countries. And as an embargo afterwards, actually, they have to stay in the country uh, to do or to work I mean, towards what they've I mean, researched. Uh, so it's somehow changing because of these scholarships. OK, I think we have time for two very quick questions before I ask for the round up. So people who haven't spoken before, maybe we'll take one from either side of the room. Um, the lady, the lady at this table. Um, my name is Rosamond Southgate. I'm from Médecins Sans Frontières, um, where we are all too aware of the gaps between uh, what is known in research and what we do in practice. Um, so I very much welcome several of the panelists um, saying, mentioning about minding the gap and that now is the time to focus on implementation and translation. So my question is, how do we, uh, how do we make that shift um, beyond applying for a grant from the Grand Challenges Fund, which <laughs> I think is a good first step. Thank you. Thank you. And one more from this side of the room. Um, I'm very, I, I think this gentleman was first. Just a, a short comment, um, if I might. It's, uh, it's troubling to me. Jim Kendra here from the Disaster Research Center at the University of Delaware. It is troubling to me to hear sort of the, the tenor developing that disaster research is either a pointless or an immoral and deviant activity um, that people engage in only to advance their own careers. I don't think that's the case. It's certainly not the case amongst uh, any of the colleagues that I know in the disaster field. And um, yes, I have no question. That is just my comment. Thank you. <laughs> OK. Um, You've got 20 minutes. 20? OK. I, I'll take one more. Um, ben. Ben. <coughs> uh, uh, sorry. Um, yeah, uh, ben, ben Wisner, uh, University College London. Um, d does the panel think that over the next 40 years, uh, this entire problematic, this entire area will become more political and in particular <laughs> will bring in more um, moral, ethical, and especially legal issues. Uh, at the global level, will there be more discussion of a human right uh, to uh, protection, each government protecting their citizens from avoidable harm uh, in natural hazards, and at the local level, remembering there are over 2,000 counties in the United States, over, uh, and, and, and 3,000 counties in the United States, 2,000 counties in China, and so much of the growth engine, so much of the disaster creation takes place at this local level. Will there be much more prosecution of people for corporate manslaughter, for willful ignorance, at that level, both in governments and the, in the government private uh, initiatives at that scale. Thank you. Thank you. So, any takers on our panel? We have three. Qu th yeah. can, can take. Thank you, Luca. Yeah, I, I think let me, let me start with the last question. I think there's a, a very important question about the issues of. Uh, for the next 40 years. And I think I highlighted the issue of uh, political instability and the issue of a state. But I think if you, if you, I think that your point is very valid in a sense that what we are going to see is uh, a, a, a clear case of a state fragility that is going to erode the whole lot of access to justice. 
And for me, this is this is an issue that is going to be the, the whole of the state is becoming an issue. And I and I and I, I, I and I am saying this one because it is uh, it is um, if you look at the World Development Report of 2011, access to justice has, is a quite a prerequisite for stability and issue of fragility. And 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 and, and, and if you look if, if, for example the example of South Sudan the whole lot of, of sovereignty and legitimacy of the state becoming an issue. And, 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 the, and, the, and the, whether the sovereignty is, is, is a responsibility and the failure of the state to, to, to provide that responsibility is getting us to the debate about our global commitment to the, uh, to the issue of uh, citizen security, citizen justice. But let me just to, to link to this one, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the issue of research gap to MSF. I, I, one of the one of the things that I I saw in South Sudan during the famine <laughs> is to one level that the, the NGOs or the or the uh, the uh, the institutional memory of these organizations, and especially this this very high level of turnover, whether these organizations they have institutions and memories are being built in the in in these organizations or actually with people and we have seen a very repetitive sort of learning from what lessons you can learn and it seems as if most of this experience seems to be fading away with the year uh, with the year uh, with the year uh, with the people employed and i think the debate is really to look to the year uh, today how much we can retain the retention of our experiences within within the uh, within the uh, organization and especially for the humanitarian humanitarian work i think i just want to have an, a note also uh, about this issue disaster should not be scaring really I, i'm one of the people researchers should be encouraged to do research in disasters i think that is that is for me i'm one of the people i did my research during a difficult time and we should not go back to the period that oh disaster is so scaring we cannot do a lot of things in it exactly that's the point that we should do research in the disasters, and I should really encourage the uh, the, uh, the student that they should need to 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 take it as an opportunity. But it's very challenging. I agree with the issue of experience, uh, but the the most important this is an area that I think we should keep uh, engaging. Thanks. Thanks very much for that, Luca. Um, any more reflections on that question, or perhaps the 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 other points? Uh, regarding the question of uh, minding the gap, which I still cannot find the, the best answer, I would say, however, that uh, a first step will be to work to go together in the field with, uh, with policymakers. I think that we need not only to understand the context, but also to identify realistic practices according to the different perspectives. And that maybe nowadays we can do it on a voluntary basis. But just to link the two questions uh, with, uh, with Ben's um, comment, I would say that uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that in the, in the following years to come, and not maybe in 40 years, but before that, we will have more issues related to prosecution, legal issues, and, and so on. I think we have already started with the case of L'Aquila that David Alexander is very familiar with. Uh, so I would say that maybe nowadays we have still the chance to do it, to, this, to do this integration on, 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 on a goodwill, but perhaps due to these uh, legal issues that are uh, more um, evident every day, we will have to do it, we, whether we like it or not. And I think that is something to really think about it. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to just take one more question, but from our online audience, who've been very patient and are dependent on me to be able to, to, to have a voice. So we have another question. In fact, we have two questions from PhD students. So this has generated a lot of interest. Uh, Lily Bull, uh, Bui, um, a PhD student with MIT, she is asking, what are the leading challenges for planned versus market-based governments in dealing with long-term disaster recovery efforts? 
And the second question is from Nick, a PhD student in the UK. To all the panellists, how well do you think the indirect impacts of disasters are considered in research and policy? And what does this mean for vulnerable populations? It's a fairly general question. So because we are fairly short, what I'd like to do is go round and ask you for your reflections on those questions, if you would like, or at the same time, maybe give your final comments um, in terms of, in relation to kind of wrapping up the session. So um, who would like to start? <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll take a shot on the issue of the uh, leading challenge for planned uh, or market-based economy for addressing uh, disasters. Um, I, I, I think that, um, um, of course, disasters uh, will always be there. I think that, uh, 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 so no matter uh, whether it's a planned economy or market-based economy, that you all always have to deal with those issues. Uh, I, I think the challenge for market-based economies is how do you really uh, 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 develop a sort of a, a governance system that um, that can take uh, you know to can make the uh, the market and then the the society and the uh, the policy that work together in sync in a in a in an integrated fashion so that actually the the um, the disasters can be addressed uh, i I think for the planned economy I think it's very hard to think about you know, for a planned economy in, in sort of addressing the uh, the um, disasters, because I think that, of course, planned economy can be, uh, in, in the short term, I think can be good or bad. Uh, there, there could be, I think indeed, I think in certain phase of the development, that can be uh, uh, quite effective. Uh, but in the long run, certainly I think that we've seen the failure of the planned economy. So I'm not so sure whether uh, that's a valid uh, issue to, to address. Any more reflections on the two questions? I mean, the, the indirect impact one is a, is a challenging one, and that may be one of these, I mean, niches or places where we need more research somehow, possibly. Um, potentially a good PhD there. <laughs> Excellent. I'm very pleased that JC has actually admitted we might need some more research. <laughs> but I stick to my point. All right. Okay. All right. Well, what I'd like to do now is just ask each panelist for a final thought before closing. And um, maybe, Luca, we could start with you. Yeah, I, I think first, I, the point I would like to, to, to conclude is that the disaster will continue to stimulate our thinking, very challenging, is, uh, is quite demanding. It is it's a reality of life. And I, I, I think it is, it is a point that I, I, I could say is a, is a... But let me just highlight the issue of local research institutions. I do understand uh, in most cases, although I, I heard the global funding for these specific things, my personal experience is that in most cases, uh, most of these donors, they fund individual researchers but there's no, and even the think tanks, sometimes we have think tanks that are created specifically to, to, to meet the demand of donors, rather than building on the very institutions that are there. For example, in, 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 South, in the context of, of Africa, you have universities well established, and these universities, they will exist, unlike some of the think, think tanks they can face out. I think it would be very important for the uh, for the more focus to be done on the uh, on the uh, on these the uh, the universities, uh, this, especially they are getting a lot of not not funding. And if some some of these global funding, I think could could be targeted some of these 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 universities and and focus on the research. I think we can see we can measure it. We can see really we have done we have done something that that is very very important. The last one. I just want to highlight the, the role of civil society in the research and the dissemination filling the gap. I, I, I am one of the people, my own personal experience, one in the University of Yuba, using a very effective civil society to work together. They, they are more effective in the, rather than the research dealing with the policymakers. Yes, I do understand. You need to understand 
the mindset of the of the policymakers and the and the and the and the government. In most cases, government they have their own agenda. But it is when you have civil society that is very effective in in in, in championing some of these findings to become advocates. I think you can do a lot of work. You can do a lot of. You can fill this gap between the year. The final one is for the practice. I think we need to take stock of of, of our practices, especially for the uh, the uh, in the uh, in the NGO sector. I think there's a lot of a lot of a lot of our learning. Of what is happening? What are we learning? What are we learning? I think that's a as a self as a self assessment of what has happened. I think would be very important. Thanks. Thank you very much for that. Uh, very helpful. Okay. Okay, well, th there are many challenges indeed, but my top three would be integrated research for disaster risk to address root causes and risk drivers. Second is related to education. We need to educate the society, the, poli uh, the policy makers and, and the, um, the politicians of tomorrow. I think the ones that exist nowadays, they are already spoiled, so we need to look in the, into the future. And then the third one is related to establishing legal frameworks that allow the implementation of disaster risk reduction at all levels, because sometimes they really at local level interfere with the nationals and, and so on. So those could be my three points. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think that uh, maybe I, I use the three keywords. I, th I think the first one is uh, probably uh, adaptation. I think that we, we, of course, we always, always want to get rid of the disasters and uh, prevent disasters and so on. But I think uh, ultimately we have to learn to, to coexist with uh, disasters. Uh, so I think that's the first one. I think the second one is the humanities. I think that uh, when we learn about, you know, the, when we do research and so on, we often think that we may find some sort of, uh, you know, general rules and the general sort of, you know, um, underlying uh, principles and so on that could help us to uh, prevent the disasters. And, but every time, even sort of the, you know, very familiar, you know, issue, uh, disasters, for example, in terms of flood and so on, every time it, it, it came in different ways. Every time it's um, always different, unique. So I think that uh, so we have to be humble to <coughs> to to recognize the limitation of our, our our abilities, and the third is indeed to to uh, the, it's the learning. I think that uh, um, uh, you know I think probably the best way for us to uh, you know to to do study is to learn it to learn from each disaster. I think each disaster is offering probably the, the best cases for us to uh, to gain uh, to improve our ability to address those issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. JC? Thanks. Uh, I wanted to emphasize my initial point about power relations between researchers in different regions of the world, but ultimately I will follow on Lucas' point, which is an important mm -hmm. one, I think. How do we engage the civil society in, in research, and how do we create collaboration? And I think one of the issues we face is that the, res the academic research environment is very much based on upward accountability. Uh, towards the university, towards the funding agencies. And if we want to do research uh, with civil society organizations, we, have, we need some sort of downward accountability for them to actually uh, drive the agenda, uh, but just try to actually get a proposal submitted anywhere with uh, the objectives being to be defined by the locals, uh, the local stakeholders. That's kind of the having the space for actually engaging, the, the institutional space for actually engaging with civil society is, is a very difficult uh, and challenging one at the moment. Thank you very much. Um, I want to finish by thanking our panel and um, just saying what a privilege it's been for me to, to be sitting here alongside you and to, to hear your presentations. And I must admit, I've been... Um, I find it almost thrilling to hear the emphasis that you've put on some of these themes, in particular the one about collaboration and actually describing mechanisms for taking that forward, such as partnerships, networks, stakeholders, but at the same time discussing the risks, the competition, um, the power relations. <laughs> Um, and it just strikes me that um, what we see is actually, yes, partnerships are being actively promoted, as we heard um, from Mike, but often the partnerships that are supported are not partnerships with 
local stakeholders, there are many difficulties. We've, we, in, in my own work, we face difficulties in developing those. Um, we, we have networks. Um, we have partners, but actually to get support for that is um, very difficult. Rather, we're driven into more kind of international partnerships. Um, anyway, um, I want to once again thank the panel and a huge thank you to, to you um, in the room, but also to our online um, audience. Um, I hope you found it useful and, and interesting and enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, you'll find ref refreshments next door and I I think we have, is it one hour break, Sarah? Back one here. Break. You're welcome to bring the food in here if you prepare. If you want to have a table to so have your lunch. But yeah, there is lunch <laughs> next door. And yes, for the online audience, we restarted to. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you very much.